Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the School of Public Affairs. I'm the interim dean, Allison Jackowitz, and I'm very pleased to open this special event during the school's 90th anniversary year. I'm very excited to hear from Secretary Armando, but first I want to introduce Betsy Fisher Martin, who will moderate our fireside chat. Betsy Fisher Martin is the executive director of the School of Public Affairs Women in Politics Institute and an executive in residence with the Department of Government. In the fall of 2023, she was a resident fellow of Harvard's Kennedy School Institute of Politics, where she conducted a weekly seminar on the presidential election. Prior to joining SPA, she spent over 20 years with NBC News. During this time, she served as executive producer of the press, as well as managing editor of NBC News political program. I'm very pleased Betsy is here with us today, and I'm glad to turn the floor over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. I'm glad you all could be here today. We have a very special guest. Gina Romano, Secretary of Commerce, who is from the great state of Rhode Island. Any Rhode Island? Okay, that's a problem. So <laughs> she did her bachelor's in economics from Harvard, was a Rhodes Scholar, and then went to Yale Law School, Ms. Poppy, right? Um, she clerked for a district court judge, worked in venture capital, had her own firm, and then ran for treasurer of Rhode Island. Um, then she also ran for governor successfully and served uh, two terms. She was also the chair of the Democratic Governors Association. Mm -hmm. And of course, um, President Biden uh, nominated her as the 40th Secretary of Commerce. Do I have that right? Yeah, 40th Secretary of Commerce. So, 40th Secretary of Commerce, first woman governor of Rhode Island, and we're thrilled she could be with us today. So, yeah, of course, great, great to see you. <laughs> she also has coming up on Sunday. I saw on Twitter, yes, X, whatever you want to call it. Um, she's getting the full 60 minutes profile treatment this Sunday, so be sure to tune in for that. But I, the little teaser that CBS had up said that you uh, quote turned the second tier agency into a center of national security. Manufacturing and job creation. Those are nice words. That's not not a <laughs> I don't think I should tell you to tune in because I really don't know how it's going to go. <laughs> it sounds like but it will be I'm great. It will be okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, I thought we would talk a little bit about your role at Commerce. Of course, um, I'd love to talk to you a little bit too about women's politics and the women issues. Um, going on, um, and then we have a little lightning round at the end. For oh, some fun. Oh, okay. um, so first at Commerce, um, your portfolio there, I mentioned that CBS glowing assessment, but talk a little bit about how you manage all. You've got 50,000 employees, dozens of bureaus, um, and some really key policy areas. So give us a yeah. sense of, of that scope that you're working with. You know, um, the Commerce Department is is huge. By the way, I have had a number of AU um, interns, and they're all spectacular. Of course. Uh, yeah, yeah. By the way, well, see all the my three staff right there. They're all from AU. Uh -huh. um, I brought the home team, and they're all fabulous. So I'm recruiting you. But um, so look, we do so much commerce. We just to give you a flavor. We at the Commerce Department run the Census Bureau. We run the Patent and Trademark Office. We run the Office of Space Commerce. We run the Weather Service. Amazing. <laughs> it's crazy, right? We run, uh, and then what everyone knows us for, you know, like business, right. commerce, and trade. So, uh, and now recently we're building. Um, the AI Safety Institute. So we're going to be moving out on with a primary AI agency in the federal government, which is new. And For all the regulations and possible yeah. AI. And all yes, that. exactly. Yeah. We're developing the standards for what is responsible AI, what is safe AI. Um, and then I've built a team of 200 people to run the CHIPS office, all about semiconductors. So, you know, it's so when I first got the job, I said, okay, what did all these things have in common? Yeah. You know, and I decided what they all have in common is um, they're all designed to enhance America's competitiveness, helping America to outcompete the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. 
either by protecting our technology from China or Russia or Iran, or by investing in AI and chips so we can run faster. And so that's been the through line that I've tried to you know, when you manage and knowing the weather, that's a key thing. Knowing, too. I, 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 I keep your crotch without knowing the weather. But like, yeah. you have 50,000 people in the world. Yeah. How do you manage all these people? So yeah. I said, you need a through line, you need a thing, a mission that everyone's focused on. That's great. Um, you mentioned chips. So let me ask you about that because that has been no small feat and has taken up a, a lot of your time. <clears throat> um, Explain a little bit about um, the semiconductor industry and why that's so important for our economy. Yes. I mean, you guys, it's like everyone, do you guys feel like you know how important chips are? Ish. The only reason I say that is because pre pandemic, you probably wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. But then when the pandemic hit, it was really hard to buy a car, to rental car prices went through the roof. Uh, it was very hard to get your appliances. Mm -hmm. You're coming out from buying appliances. I'm sure you had friends <laughs> yeah. who couldn't get a refrigerator or whatever. Um, Ford laid off 10,000 people. All the reason for this is because of lack of access to chips. Mm -hmm. It's like a thousand chips in a car. Yeah, that would shift in the car. Well, the windshield wipers on your car work because of chips. They're like mini, mini computers that process. So anyway, turns out the United States of America doesn't make any sophisticated semiconductors. Zero. We buy 92% from Taiwan and the rest from Korea. So in the pandemic, we realized this is a pretty big problem. So we passed the Congress passed the Chips Act, and which provided subsidies to big companies to build manufacturing facilities in the United States to make semiconductors in America. At the time we did it, we knew we needed to do that because every every piece of military equipment, drones, fighter jets, satellites, submarines, chips, chips, chips. Since then, though, AI, all AI runs on chips. It takes about 10,000 chips to train a sophisticated AI model. Because you've got all that data. Because you have all that data. You need to process all the data in data centers, mm -hmm. which are run on chips. So imagine a world where the most sophisticated AI models, each one is 10,000 chips, and we're buying all those chips from Taiwan. That's scary. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing, uh, Monday I was in Texas announcing a huge chip facility build out. Um, they're gonna build a facility that's 11, the length of 11 football fields, wow. only two of them. The week before that I was in Arizona, the week before that in Arizona, next week I'll be in Syracuse. We gotta make stuff in America. And what's the timeline on how that will scale? Um, starting right now, yeah. like there were 52 cranes in the sky in Texas this week. It was a beautiful sight. <laughs> I, I, today I bought it. We toil away in the commerce department. Yeah, yeah. Often, not me, but people work for me, like in the basement with no windows. <laughs> and it's fun to get out of the basement yeah. and see 52 cranes and all these people working. So they're going to start now and then really between now and the end of the decade, like the next five or six years you'll see a huge ramp. Also in chips, you advocated for and felt strongly about a child care yes. provision mm -hmm. in chips, which when you say it, you're like, what? So what does that what does that do and why was that important to make sure to get in Yeah, so I took some <laughs> heat for this, but when companies like Intel, Samsung, uh, I don't know, Micron, they're all coming to us for money. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, give us money and we'll build a factory in America. Fine. I say this is, should be some strings attached. Right? Like, if you're going to take state, if you're going to take federal money, right. um, you get a build in America, you get cybersecurity protections, certain taxpayer protections. I also said you need to have a workforce plan 
and included in that a child care plan. Tell me how you're going to train workers and how you're going to provide child care for workers. Now, people criticize me saying, well, that's, that's your own political social policy. My view is it's not. It's just economics. You're not going to get women to work in these facilities unless you provide have some provision of child care. Right, we always hear about STEM and the lack of women in the STEM field when you're right. talking about making it more accessible in languages, right? 100%, I mean, by the way, Samsung, which is a Korean company, mm -hmm. they have child care centers on campus in Seoul. Mm -hmm. TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, has child care in Taiwan. Japan, mm -hmm. Tokyo Electron, provides child care. So, you know, if we were smart, we would too. Yeah. So women can work, show up at work early, work the full day, not worry about providing child care or not paying $2,000 a month for child care. You know, right. so I just felt that it was honestly like protection of our investment to make sure they have the people they needed to work, including women, right. in the facility. Speaking of women, I want to ask you about kind of this new generation. I mentioned that you were the first female governor mm -hmm. uh, of Rhode Island. Um, what would your kind of advice to this next generation of young women and the here um, entering the workforce in different fields? You have like some general advice. It's hard. Yeah. Well, so just know that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it's hard for everyone to be fair. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean it's hard. I would say um don't I get asked all the time about imposter syndrome, which I'm learning about. Um try to not it's really not about you. Don't ask yourself, do I belong here? Should I speak up? Uh, it's really not about you. It's about the job you're doing. So your job, whatever job you do, is to show up prepared and add value. Period. That means sometimes that means speaking up, sometimes that means staying late, sometimes that means whatever. But like trying to just focus on doing the job exceeding expectations that are set for you at every turn. And instead of saying, you know, what's good for me, like how can I exceed expectations and deliver? If you have that mindset, chances are you'll find yourself not asking for permission, not wondering why you're in the room, not being afraid to speak up because you realize if you're going to do the job, you have to. And so I don't know if that makes sense to you at your age and stage, but it's some good advice that I have for you. Um, exceeding expectations at each step is pretty critical, I think. Uh, don't be afraid to take risk. I would say that to all of you, but all the studies show women are, we're not bred to take risks. We're bred to please back to the world. So, you know, sometimes you have to take some risk, you know, um, and also I just end by saying it, it is hard. If you feel you're being dismissed, now you have a good idea because you're a woman, you probably are. Like racism is alive and well, sexism is alive and well, it sucks, but it is. So go back at it, call it out when you see it, find yourself sponsored champions and mentors and just Single advice I have is like one foot in front of the other every day, keep going. So in the entire history of the U.S., there's only been 49 women who have been governors. That's insane. Isn't that crazy? When I became governor? Yeah, yeah, there were five, right? Five when mm -hmm. you became governor. Mm -hmm. um, 12 now, which is a record yeah. at one time. Yeah. But I wanted to ask you just kind of your path, and you talked about taking risks. Yeah. How was that journey from you to kind of enter um, elected politics and everything that goes along with it? Um, 
talk about some of that risk taking and why it's, why you think it's important for yeah young women to, to do think it. about putting themselves out there for that. So the thing is, I my sport um, was rugby. I played rugby in college <laughs> and grad school. And as you can see, I was not the biggest girl on the team. <laughs> So that was critical training for yeah, politics. Yeah. Like get the shit kicked out yeah. of you. <laughs> like every day. <laughs> uh, don't be afraid to get money. So that's what you just need to know. You gotta put your armor on and go into battle. But look at if women and young people and people from different you know walks of life don't get involved, bad things will happen. You know, things that you thought couldn't happen will. Like, you know, you look what's happening. Rights being taken away as it relates to access to health care. IVF, full range of reproductive services. Like things that we thought were, could never happen, will happen unless you get in the game. Uh, so it is hard. For sure. But if our country, our values, our democracy, our way of life are worth fighting for. And you cannot choose to disengage and be, you know, apathetic just because it's hard. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, that's why you should do it. Mm -hmm. That's why you have to do it. And listen, I've been doing this now for 15 years. It's about to be 53. I am more optimistic and less cynical about ability to do good things in government than I was when I started. Don't ever believe anyone who says, oh, Washington's broken. What's the point anyway? Yes, it's massively dysfunctional. <laughs> I'm not saying it works. <laughs> However, what I am saying is if good people, smart people, dedicated, principled, idealistic people get involved, the world is a better place, easily. So you, sh you should definitely do it. By the way, when I first became governor, so I guess I was 42, um, I frequently would be in National Governors Association meetings. Just doing my thing. Yeah. And I picked my head up and looked around and suddenly realized I was in a room with 20 other white men over six years. And you just suddenly realized that, wow, this is weird. Yeah. Because there were four female governors, two of us were Democrats. Yeah. And we weren't all at every meeting every time. Right. Do you think, though, that um, the electorate has gotten more comfortable with women in the executive position? Barely. Um, I mean, the numbers have gotten better, but still. Barely. Because it's, it's um, you know, there's been studies that have shown that the verse, you know, women, it's a different quality that people look for in an executive versus a legislative aspect. I'll answer it if you answer it, too. Yeah. You, <laughs> I like your answer. You know more than I do about this. Uh, so I realize I'm here to fire you guys up. So maybe I'll <laughs> not share my thoughts. Um, I think it's tough. Yeah. I look at. I think that uh, getting elected as a woman to the Senate or legislative branch is much easier. When you try to be elected to the chief executive, president, governor, CEO of a company, or even mayor, mayor, yeah, mayor. Uh, CEO of a company, mm -hmm. um, it's much harder. And I think I've thought myself why. And I think basically to have the top job, uh, people are just uncomfortable with women in charge, like the bottom line. I think to be a leader, you have to be strong. You have to be decisive. And it's really hard to be that as a woman and be likable. Kind of just that. If you're likable, you're not seen you're as tough soft. enough. Yeah. If you're too tough, you're not uh, like, you know, B-I-T-T-H. Correct. You're not likable. Yeah. And I'm going to tell, I'm going to assert something. 
every single one of us in this room feels that way. Now you might say, not me. I'm not talking about myself, but I, I catch myself all the time. A woman will act a certain way and you're like, that was annoying. Mm -hmm. But was it really? Yeah, I never would have thought that was yeah. annoying for a man. It's very hard. So when we, so when voters, voters forever, why is it that they say the same thing about every woman who's run for president or governor? I like her thought. There's something about her. She's too good, pushy. Yeah. She's too that. We used to do focus groups on me when I was governor. Uh, and they were like, I don't know. There's something about her. And they'd show pictures of me. And they'd be like, yeah, I don't really like her. Another picture, yeah, not so much. And then they'd show me in different clothes and colors. Okay. And then casual clothes. Casual clothes, jeans, shorts, khakis. Yeah, yeah, you know, I kind of like her. Anything that diminishes our authority makes you more likable. So that's not a thinking thing. That's right. a feeling thing. And that makes it tough. It so my, so what, so that's my thought. Because the more we normalize yeah. women in these offices, then the less weird we are for wanting to be yeah. the boss. That's why I think even, you know, in 2020, when we had seven women running for president and having Perfect. seven women up on the stage, even though none of them obviously won, it was, I think, a good thing because mm -hmm. it does normalize that. Now we have 12 governors, right? Mm -hmm. I think we're, the more it's, it's a, a little bit of a, it builds. And so the more we have, the better, the better it is. I agree completely on that. That seems to be a trailblazer. <laughs> but do you think, and you know, the press isn't fabulous either. No, no, they're not. They they're not. Because they can get the stories of, you know, the staffers, oh, she's horrible to yeah. work for. Like, the stories don't materialize very much with men. Like, ever. Yeah. <laughs> But I think at least, you know, in 2020, when we had that conversation during the debates, when Elizabeth Warren and maybe Klobuchar talked about that in a very clear yeah. way, mm -hmm. I thought that was also good to put it out there. Mm -hmm. And so people can do, I mean, you mentioned the see, see something, say something. I think that applies, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to, to the press and media and mm -hmm. women as well. We see double standards. Absolutely. Out against them. Absolutely. You know. But guys need to, too. Oh, yeah. You know, for see sure. something, say something. For sure, for sure. Um, let's see. I wanted to ask you, um, you talked a little bit about AI, but I wanted to go back to that in one one thing, and then we'll do our lightning round. We have some time. Is that like 10 minutes? Is that okay, Sal? Yeah. Okay. Um, why do you think it's important to have the regulations around AI? Yeah. And when we see what Europe is doing, yeah. they're more advanced than us in terms of yeah. regulatory. And, and when you're talking about businesses here, what sort of reception do big companies have on the regulation front when you think about AI? So it's a really complicated question and a good question and something that you should start thinking about as the next generation. This AI is here to stay and will be the tiny back of your generation. Um, the thing about AI is, unlike, say, social media, mm -hmm. social media can be bad, and we've seen it. AI can be, like, catastrophically bad. Mm -hmm. So AI in the hands of China or Iran, as applied to nuclear simulation or bioterrorism, is very bad. Um, mm -hmm. And we're getting really close to the point where the technology can do it in the wrong hands and do some really scary things, which is different than social media. But we're starting early on it too. Like having yeah. the bag on social media. There was not a lot of also responsible true. social media talk early early on. That's a really right? good point. That's a really good point. Maybe we've learned our lesson, yeah. actually. So I think it's we've learned our lesson, but also it's just way Bigger. more pernicious. Yeah. So I think that we're trying to say, keep a lid on the worst of it. Yeah. But if we overly um, regulate and slow down the pace of innovation in this country, then other countries- What does that mean for our competitive 
from a ton, which you also need to think about. Yeah, so that's what I spend a lot of my own time thinking about. What's the line? Right. We want to, for example, take to China. We want to, we want to deny China getting access for sure. Yeah. But we can't slow ourselves down so much because they're not that much behind. We always have to stay relatively ahead of that. Right. So it's a it's quite complicated. And you had a big trip there not too long ago. I did. Yes. And when I was there, my last day there, China chose my, the occasion of my visit to release their very sophisticated new phone built on a semiconductor that I was trying to deny them access to, <laughs> which was kind of their way. <laughs> So yeah, it this this is real. Yeah. The competition with China around tech is real. So we have to both run as fast as we can here, which means we're gonna be careful not to squash our innovation, right? Which arguably has happened in Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, Europe has really regulated tech. And that's a good thing. Like they have privacy legislation, they have child you know, protections, but they don't have a single big tech company, really. Yeah. So it's complicated. Yeah. Things that keep you up at night. Quite literally, <laughs> at night. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, we have some quick questions here. Um, is there a book you would recommend reading or one that you particularly enjoyed reading lately in your not in spare time? <laughs> um, I'm not reading my reading time. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm reading David Brooks' How to oh, yeah. Know a Person. Yeah. Um, my husband makes fun of me, but I like it. Are you going to say like some trashy beach album? <laughs> 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 my favorite book. Like David Brooks. <laughs> I don't, now, David Brooks is the road to character yeah. I also love. Um, I love Muhammad Yunus's mm. A World Without Poverty. Yeah. You should read that. I love that book so That's much. Good. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. A uh, woman leader you most admire? Madeline Albright. Hmm. Well, pretty. I love her quote about there's a special place now for women who don't help other women. Yeah. <laughs> she, I just think she's something else. Mm -hmm. uh, favorite country that you've visited during your time in office? India. Really? Yeah. How many countries have you visited? Do you know? Yeah. <laughs> Jenny, I don't know. <laughs> How many, How many countries do you guys keep a running town? Six would be my guess. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. 20. Anyway, I love India. Okay, cool. I'm very bullish on India. Um, most surprising aspect about the Department of Commerce. You mentioned the bottom scope, which everything inside the department, but anything else that surprising to you when you got there? Like everything. I mean, it's a wacky place, but I, I, I like it. I like it. It's crazy. You know, we deal with fish and sail. Like I have, I have a whole fleet of boat, ship, vessels that are out around the world at any given moment. Is it still the aquarium in DC? No, they, they got rid of the aquarium. It used to be an aquarium at the Department of Commerce. Is that a COVID thing? Like, I, I think it was, was kind of yeah. I it was like it. a little known secret, and there was never anybody in there. You could kind of go in and have like your. I'm sad experience. I never got to see it. Um, let's see. <laughs> Most important question here. Um, given your roots um, in Providence, it's such a great food town. Have you been able to find any good Italian food in Washington? Oh. <laughs> oh, wow. Hey, can we have this discussion? <laughs> you know what? I really, this place needs an Italian yeah. bakery. Yeah. It's, have you found a good Italian bakery? Is anyone Italian here? I'll tell you that. No. Oh. Okay. It's all French. French bakeries everywhere. Yeah. Delicious. <laughs> I have not even searching. A good Italian bakery, they don't exist. That's so true. I'm gonna start one. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, there's some good Italian restaurants, of course, but nothing right now. Right no, right on the mm -hmm. uh, Well, Secretary Mondo, I think we're out of time, but just wanted to thank you so much for coming by and speaking to us today. We really appreciate it. No, 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 thank you yeah. so much. Would you guys have anything you want to tell me?
Something I should know. Something you want to ask. Question for me, I just yes, I'm a PhD student here, and I'm yeah. studying the intersection of domestic labor and women's participation in the public sphere. Yes, and so I'm a little obsessed with your childcare yeah. or with tech companies. Do you yes. Know? Um, the economist Claudia Golden talks a lot yeah. about women's participation in the public sphere being directly related to their ability to outsource some of that domestic labor and child care. And I think it's great. So I appreciate it. Claudia is amazing. She was one of my professors in Florida. Okay. She recently won the Nobel Prize in Economics. She's amazing. Uh, and right. And once again, the rest of the world figures that out. Japanese female labor force participation is way higher than the United States. The Netherlands, way. It's like, this is not rocket science. 50% um, of Americans live in what they call a child care desert, which is there's a, it's not like affordable, accessible child care. Most people I know, I'm obviously a lot older than you, pay more for their child care than mortgage in a month. Mm -hmm. So, especially in DC. Yeah, even in Rhode Island, yeah. that was the case. So it's like, how are you supposed to work? So good. I'm glad you're studying that. And she works with us at the Pocket Center. I love it. <laughs> well, if you want an internship, come see me. <laughs> you're going to have 25 <laughs> applications. <laughs> 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 <laughs>